When Britain became Roman, the Britons gained access to the finest goods the empire could offer. The Roman economy was fueled by trade, but they had trouble meeting the demand for luxury goods like jewellery. What they needed was the raw materials, the ores, and that is one of the principal reasons why the Romans came to Britain and stayed here for 400 years. But this trade would have been impossible without their amazing network of roads. This is Richborough near Dover, and it was here that the Romans first landed to conquer Britain in AD 43. At first, they secured the site with great defensive ditches, but quickly it developed to become Portus Rutupii, a major port and supply depot, and the first gateway to the new province of Britain. The port soon developed into a bustling town with shops, temples, and even an amphitheatre for entertainment. And because of its delicious oysters, the town became famous throughout the empire. Right on the quayside, they built the most fantastic structure. It was a huge triumphal arch. It was 25 metres high, so anyone standing on the ground would only have come up to about here. It was made of white marble, very much like the Marble Arch in London, except the whole thing was covered with bronze statues. Everyone who came ashore would have had to walk through here, and it must have been a very powerful reminder of who was in charge of this new province. Every day, shiploads of troops and supplies arrived, and the first priority was to get them out to the front line. So this was where the Roman engineers started. The first Roman road in Britain was built right through the arch and straight off there to Canterbury. From the gate of the fort, the road carried on along this very line through the Kent countryside. So I'm actually walking along the edge of the Roman road and these may even be original Roman cobbles. Look, here's a bit of Roman pottery just discarded by the side of the road. The first road led to the city they built as their capital, London. From there, it went to St Albans and onward to the army camps on the northern frontier. And 2,000 years later, it's still one of the major freight routes across England. We don't know what the Romans called it, but the Saxon name was Watling Street, and today it's the A2 and the A5. The most obvious thing about Roman roads is that they're straight. But what amazed me is that even when they couldn't see where they were heading, they somehow managed to set off in precisely the right direction. A perfect example of this is Stane Street, which the Romans began building in London. They set off in exactly the right direction for Chichester, 65 miles away, even though the North and South Downs completely block the view. But the Romans had an ingenious method of surveying the route before they started to build. Here I am at London, what they called Londinium, and I know that Chichester, Novio Magus, is somewhere over there beyond the sand dunes on the beach. You understand I'm using these sand dunes as a sort of model for the whole of the south of England. So I'm going to light a beacon here and then set off in roughly the right direction. But I can't see all the way to Chichester, I don't know where it is. So what I'm going to do is to head for a high point there, which is roughly on the line, and then I'll start again. So first, light the beacon. There she goes. Now gather up my other beacons, and off I go to the high point. Now, this is the highest point for some distance, which is a great thing for two reasons. First of all, if there were any Celts sneaking up on me to attack, I'd be able to see them. I'd be able to defend myself up here, so it's a good place to be anyway. And the second reason is that I can see a long way. I can easily see London over there, where I've just lit a beacon, and I can see the sea. I can't see Chichester yet. It must be 
just behind that next row of sand dunes. But what I can see is another hill more or less exactly in line. So that's my next target. So all I need to do is to stick my beacon here in the ground and light it, and then I can set off for the next hill. That's the highest point. Put the beacon in. Easily see the last one. There! Hey! There's Chichester. Novi Omegas. Because I couldn't see Chichester until now, I've had to choose high points in roughly the right direction. With hills in the way, I still can't see whether all my beacons are in a straight line, but the Romans had an answer. And this is it. This is my secret weapon, a Roman groma. Now this was actually what every surveyor would carry with him in the field. It was essentially his badge of office. Let me show you how it works. It's really a beautiful and very simple piece of equipment. There's a stick that you stick in the ground and a cross on top here, which is two bits at right angles. And from each end, there's a string hanging with a weight on the end, which is just a plumb bob, so that all four strings hang absolutely vertically. Now, for this simple job, I just want to make a straight line between Chichester down there and London over the here. So, I'm going to line this up on Chichester by sighting along the strings. I can see the strings swinging each way and the flame just between them. It's a shade more like that. That's it. Now the question is, are these two beacons lined up on the previous one that I put up there? So what I do is I walk around without touching it and I sight along the same two strings in the opposite direction. Ah! Ah, what a pity. Obviously we're not quite in a straight line and I need to go back and move that beacon about, oh I guess it's about 20 yards to the left. So here we go. Using my Groma, I can adjust the position of the beacon until it's in line with the ones ahead and behind. So I can line up three beacons at once, but never all four. It's then a case of adjusting and readjusting each beacon in turn until they're all lined up. Now I've got all four beacons in a dead straight line. London, two on the hills and Chichester but it has taken me an enormous amount of walking backwards and forwards through all those sand dunes. And I reckon the Romans must have been more efficient about it. They would have had a surveyor on each hill. So there'd be one chap standing by each beacon and they could then have lined themselves up automatically once they saw the other beacons going up. And they would keep moving a little bit with their own gromers and eventually they'd all be lined up and I would never have had to move. That must be better. So in order to lay out the exact path of the road, I've got myself a minion to put the canes in. So off you go. I'll just line up my Groma in the right direction. Dexter, shade more. OK, hold it now. Dexter, that's good. Linus. The road engineers weren't complete slaves to the straight line though. If they came across a steep hill or a difficult river crossing, they'd take a sharp diversion. On surviving Roman roads like Stain Street, you can still see these angled dog legs, but you'll never find a curve. Working alone with a single Groma, it took me all day to mark out a dead straight line of about 150 metres over the sand dunes. The Romans were a lot faster, but they had plenty of practice. Their road engineers averaged a mile of road every three or four days. In the first century AD, in Britain alone, they built over 10,000 miles of roads. That's nearly three times longer than all of today's motorways. And if you know what you're looking for, you can still find them. There's a cunning clue you can use if you're looking for old Roman roads in the names of the towns and villages that have grown up along them. This is because the Saxons call Roman roads streets, and so very often the place names have street in them like Borton Street, Key Street, Lucen Street and Deerton Street. All of these are villages that have grown up along the Roman road of Watling Street. The roads were originally built for marching soldiers. 
Many of their foundations remain and in some cases have been resurfaced only half a dozen times in 2,000 years, yet they're still the arteries of Britain. In just a few places, the Roman construction is still intact, if a little overgrown. By looking at these, we can get an idea of how they were built. Underneath this grassy bank is a genuine Roman road, still intact after almost 2,000 years. It's called Ackling Dyke, and it led from the little settlements in the south to the major town of Salisbury, way up north. This particular area is full of Iron Age burial mounds, like this one behind me. And the Romans paid no attention to those at all. They simply drove the road straight vroom, through the middle of them. So as well as having an important road, they were also making a powerful political statement. The most impressive thing about this road is this huge bank, the Agar, two metres high, on top of which they actually built the road surface. Now, I'd like to show you the construction of this road, but unfortunately, it's a listed monument, so I can't dig it up, and I'm going to have to make my own. First, they dig ditches on either side of the road to act as drains. The foundations were often made from huge flat boulders. And onto these, the agar was built, a bank of gravel, chalk or sand, packed in thin layers to as high as two metres. Next, the edges of the road were marked with stout curbstones before the surface was covered with flat stones laid carefully together like crazy paving. And on top, a layer of fine gravel was packed down over the stone and rolled flat to give a smooth, all-weather surface, perfect for the marching feet of the legionaries. The road network became an integral part of the Roman administration of Britain because the governors used the roads to help calculate their taxes. Taxes were levied on every landowner according to the size of the farm or the estate. So it was vital for the Romans to know exactly how much land everyone owned. For the first time ever, this northwestern corner of the empire was crisscrossed by a grid of roads. And this grid was used as a reference to work out the area of every landowner's property. So the key to accurate determination of the taxes was accurate measurement of the roads. We know that Roman roads had milestones. Every mile along the road they put a huge great carved block of stone with the names of the road builders and information for travellers all carved on it. But the question is, how did they know where to put the milestones? The Roman mile was a thousand paces, in Latin milli passium, and we get our word mile from the Latin milli. So what they had to do was to measure a thousand paces. Now, it was an official pacing stick, and this is it. And from one end to the other is an official Roman pace. And I'm going to make it easier by tying my shoelaces together. You'll notice that this is not one step, but two steps. So one two, and that's exactly one pace. Right, down this path between the trees to the end is just about half a mile, so I reckon if I go there and back, I should do just about a thousand paces. And I'll start here at my post. One, and two, and three, and four, and two five. on six, two on seven, two on three, 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 three four, 99, Four, three hundred, four hundred, seven, three, one, seven, eight, nine, one thousand. That is one Roman mile. This may seem like a silly method for measuring out miles of roads, but we know that the Greek army had specially trained pacing soldiers. The Romans, however, had a rather more precise mechanical way to do the job. This is an odometer. We've built it from a description of the 1st century BC by Vitruvius, the great writer on Roman science. 
It works in much the same way as its modern successor, the taximeter. Vitruvius's machine counted each mile by dropping a pebble into a tin. Its mechanism had a series of gears, just like a clock, but designed to count feet, paces and miles rather than seconds, minutes and hours. The road wheels are exactly four feet across. That means they turn 400 times every mile. The wheels connect to a large central cog with 400 teeth, which completes one full turn every mile. It's driven by a nail on the axle. In turn, this cog connects to a horizontal disc containing the pebbles, or in our case, marbles, so that after each mile, a single marble drops through a hole. There, there it goes. That's my marble, look. There it is, I've done exactly a Roman mile. So obviously, when I paced it out, I was a few yards up, but it's not bad after I did have my legs tied together and I'm very close to my milepost. Now I've just got 16 miles to do before I run out of marbles. I better get moving. Over the ages, many scientists, including Leonardo da Vinci, have written off Vitruvius's fantastic machine as impossibly cumbersome. But there's no question the maths works, and odometers in our cars work on the same principle today. All in all, I believe machines like this could well have measured out roads 2,000 years ago. Hot on the heels of the legions and the bureaucrats came merchants from all corners of the Roman Empire. Hundreds of new items were imported, and many have been faithfully reproduced by Roman reenactors. Fine Samian pottery came from the Rhineland, where for the first time ever it was mass produced by molding. From the same region came elaborately decorated glassware. And all the way from Syria came jewelry made of amber and glass beads. Britons soon developed a taste for Roman delicacies. Merchant ships brought in thousands of amphorae filled with wine, olive oil, and a Roman speciality, fish sauce. But metal items were the most precious. Silver and gold jewelry, as well as tools and equipment made of bronze and iron. They had to make all these metal things, so what they needed was the raw materials, the ores, and that is one of the principal reasons why the Romans came to Britain and stayed here for 400 years, because we had the raw materials. We had iron oxide, this is from Cumbria. We had tin, this is from Cornwall. We had copper, also from Cornwall, and if you mix the tin and the copper, you get bronze, which they used so much. We had lead, this is galena, lead sulphide, from the Mendip Hills. And of course they use that in their plumbing. The Latin for lead is plumbum. But even more important than those, the Roman economy was in trouble. They really needed to back it up. And that was one reason why they came looking for this stuff, gold. And that's why the Romans came here to South Wales, to Dolaikothi in Carmarthenshire, because they knew there was gold in these here hills. Local tribes have been looking for gold in these hills for thousands of years, using very simple methods, just looking at the streams to see if they could see nuggets being washed down, or panning like this, swirling round the gravel and looking for little nuggets among the stones, like that, look. Unfortunately, it's only fool's gold, so I won't get very rich. When the Romans came, they scaled up the operation enormously by applying their engineering skills. The Romans went straight for the seams of gold hidden in the hillside, but first they had to find them using water. Now, the way to do that was to use the water to scour away all the earth 
and the trees off the hillside, and then that should reveal veins of gold. Here is my hillside, and here is my tank of water, ready to unleash millions of gallons. One, two, three, open the sluice gates. Once they'd stripped the hillside bare, Roman miners could easily follow the gold seams deep into the rock. The key to this technique was a water supply with the power to demolish whole hillsides. And there's evidence of just that, which the National Trust's archaeologist, Emma Plunkett Dillon, showed me. We're actually walking along what might appear to be a simple path, but if you look closely, it actually is an aqueduct. It travels 11 kilometres in length, the entire distance of the Cothy Valley. It starts right at the eastern end where it traps the water from a stone-cut waterfall, travels all the way along the southern flank, picking up all the tributaries as they come down the slope towards the Cothy River in the bottom of the valley and coming all the way along to where we are standing now. You can actually see, if you look, now, now that you've told me, that it's cut out here, Indeed. isn't it? And then there's a flat bit. Yes. And then the hillside slopes down Indeed. really quite steeply. So how do you know it was Roman? We've been able to date some of these uh, aqueducts, this one and the one higher up the hill, with radiocarbon dating. We've been able to say categorically that this particular aqueduct that we're walking along was built by the Romans. Terrific. Emma took me to the site of a tank, one of a series along the hillside. Its walls were cut into the rock and the tank itself was over 20 metres long and 3 metres high. Two and a half million gallons a day flowed into the tank and the huge sluice gates channelled it onto the hillside below. All that remained was to follow the seams by digging straight into the rock. And you can still find the tunnels they dug in the hillsides. This is a genuine Roman entrance. The miners use picks like this one. It's quite a hefty lump of iron. And if you look carefully in the roof, you can still see the scratch marks made by those picks 2,000 years ago. It must have been a fantastically hard job. Just to cut this tunnel alone, they must have moved thousands of tons of rock by sheer brute force. But as they dug deeper, Roman miners faced an age-old problem, flood water filling the tunnels. The Romans seemed to have developed a fabulous practical solution to this. In 1935, a bunch of miners wanted to reopen the mine, and they broke into a chamber 45 metres underground and completely flooded with water. Well, they scrabbled around in the water and they found a whole lot of bits of wood which turned out to be extraordinary archaeological evidence. When they brought it up to the surface, most of it just crumbled away, but one bit survived. It was a bit shaped roughly like this. It had a series of nail holes around the edge and distinctive triangular cutouts. Archaeologists have suggested it could have been part of a water wheel. Our experts in ancient timber building are Henry and John Russell, and I'm about to set them a challenge. Hi, Henry and John. Henry, you reckon this is part of a water wheel? How do you know? Well, it's 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 obviously from something curved. Okay. And it could be from um, a, a, a wheel that powered um, some device. Okay. Yeah. But having these holes in the, in the side is is really um, very peculiar, and really it can't be. Anything, it's so like the ones that have been found in other parts of the world that... Um, You're convinced? I'm convinced. And you've got a huge pile of bits here. How on earth are you going to work out which bit goes where? Uh, that's a good point. Uh, at the moment, I'm actually numbering um, these mortises. Oh. And each of these mortises is for a spoke. Oh, I see. Very neat. And, and you've got Roman numerals here. Well, of course. That's what they would do. <laughs> that's very neat. And so that's one of the spokes, is it? Uh, yeah, these are the spokes and they are also numbered. Um, right. at the top and at the bottom. Right. And again, held together with pegs. But very nice. Yeah. Simple. Can, so can we see if this fits? Yeah, let's try it. It's number 12, so it should okay. fit just here. This one. 
Ah, oh, fantastic. Very elegant. So basically that's the wheel. Yep, You've just got another 24 down. or whatever it is to fit round. <laughs> well, I'll leave you to it. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> We had to sort another one more person. Let's wait a second for John. John, do you want to get up? I'll get, I'll get the other one. Now, you've just about finished it. Explain to me about these holes. What are they actually for? They're um, where the water enters the chambers and where they, it leaves the chambers okay. at the top. Okay, so the water goes in here and then it comes out again at the top. Hopefully. We'd better give it a try, haven't we? It looks fantastic, but the question is, does it work? Well, all I have to do is walk up these stairs. Come on! Ah! ah. As the wheel turns, water rushes into the chambers through the triangular holes. It's getting very difficult because of all the water on the other side of the wheel. Luckily, I'm quite heavy and I can just about overcome that. And now look, it's coming over the top. It's rushing into my channel here, out of the holes, and it's filling my bucket. It's working, and the bucket's full already. You could certainly pump water out of the mine this way. My wheel lifts the water about three metres. The Romans built tier upon tier of wheels to raise it from the deepest parts of their mines. That is terrific. Wow, but it must have needed a very fat or fit slave to keep that going all day. Wow. The Romans took the gold from this mine straight back to Rome where it was made into precious jewellery or minted into coins by the treasury. I'd like to think that some of the gold might even have made its way back here, perhaps into the pockets of the soldiers and the engineers of Roman Britain. In the next programme, The Edge of Empire, Life on Hadrian's Wall. There's loads more about what the Romans did on the BBC History website.